Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Tomasz Kosciewski. I'm the Director of Biology at CM Bio Innovations. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today uh, about the microphysiological systems um, that we've been developing and, and how we use these tools um, for human specific uh, drug discovery and, uh, and drug development. Uh, the re reason that we develop these tools uh, is for a variety of reasons, but particularly for um, those articulated in this slide, which show that actually most of the molecules that are now developed by pharmaceutical companies um, don't make it to become new medicines. Uh, as I'm sure many people are aware, 90% um, on average of all uh, drugs that go into phase one clinical trials uh, don't become an approved medicine and don't make it through the clinical trial process. And this is mainly due to both um, reasons of safety uh, and of efficacy. And we certainly strongly believe that this is driven by a lack of relevant preclinical models that allow uh, the generation of new therapeutics to, to reach clinical trials um, that are human specific and therefore are going to treat uh, human diseases while having limited toxicity profiles. So as a scientist in preclinical drug development, there are a wide variety of tools available for uh, you to analyze uh, disease biology and, and also therapeutic uh, efficacy and toxicology of compounds um, so these range from everything from in silico modeling through to um, uh, in vitro cell culture, and this can take the form of, of more basic 2D cell culture, um, now using 3D and organoid technologies, and, and then into microphysiological systems, also known as organs on chips, and all the way through to in vivo. So um, all of these different tools are available to people, and, and they have all have a variety of different um, benefits and pros and cons. And, and certainly the, the, the scientist has a, has a job to do to understand which of these is, is most relevant to the questions they're trying to ask. Traditionally, in vitro preclinical biology um, has been done on, on 2D plastic. Uh, for many years, uh, researchers have used standard cell lines which have grown on, on plastic plates. These cell lines have grown for many, many years. They're continually passage. And they're, and they're, they're immortalized and don't always represent uh, the biological features and functions of the human body that, that they're looking to try and represent. And nonetheless, these cells are easy to handle. Uh, they produce wonderful statistically significant data. Um, but when it comes to translating um, to the human disease, um, they, they struggle to often do that. So organs on chips or microphysiological systems, um, which I'll refer to as MPS, are advanced in vitro platforms um, for culturing um, and testing responses uh, related to human physiology and disease. And there are a number of criteria that we um, and the community now define um, to make up one of these technologies is. So these technologies often uh, are most commonly used primary human cells, so these should be the most translatable material to, to a human being. Um, we look to grow these cells um, in cell and, and tissue-like structures with, which have three dimensions um, with the aim to try and mimic um, tissue and organ function uh, in vitro. <clears throat> and these platforms, um, a key feature is that they utilize uh, fluidic flow to move media around these platforms uh, to allow cells then to uh, experience biomechanical stimuli um, and shear forces that they would, uh, would receive um, in vivo. And also, in particular, um, we think very carefully about how we control the dosing of compounds and therapeutics into this platform so that the dosing can as closely as possibly represent the kind of drug responses um, that occur in vivo. So MPS platforms um, can be utilized across the drug discovery process. Um, so in early sort of target discovery, uh, target ID, um, we see a place for these technologies, um, for example, using disease models um, to allow people to explore the presence of certain targets and how these might change. Um, as we go through uh, the discovery process, um, there are particular applications around DMPK and tox safety. Uh, where these tools can be very beneficial to predict um, how the how a particular compound is going to behave uh, in a human in, in a clinical development 
And then also then finally, there's a, there's a place for these technologies to complement um, clinical development, thinking about ways in which clinical trials can be designed, um, looking at precision medicine, understanding how different patient cohorts may behave differently uh, to particular compounds. So at CM Bio, um, we're a UK-based uh, biotech company. We've been building advanced in vitro platforms such as MPS for, for nearly 10 years. Um, we build single organ and multi-organ MPS platforms. Um, and we utilize these uh, for both efficacy uh, and toxici toxicity testing um, of, uh, of different molecules. And the key feature, uh, the key thing that we try to build into our technology is that these uh, MPS platforms are straightforward to set up. They're both robust uh, and simple for people to use. So they can be installed in any lab uh, anywhere in the world. And the technology that we've been building um, over a number of years is built originally from IP generated um, from Professor Linda Griffith at, at MIT. Uh, and most prominently, and, and over the last couple of years, we've been collaborating with uh, the FDA um, and particularly the, a group um, within CEDA uh, to understand how these tools can now be used for regulatory science um, and be incorporated into uh, IND submissions uh, and become a, a real workhorse of, of the pharmaceutical industry to answer a range of different questions uh, that people have uh, around the development of new medicines. So the basis of, of CMBI's MPS platform, which is known as Physiomimics, is the use of different consumable plates. So a key feature and, and a differentiator of our technology is that our plates are, are open well. They have the same footprint as standard multi-well cell culture plates, um, but they are entirely bespoke and, and generated for our platform. So each of the plates has, has different designs, um, different well shapes and structures um, to culture different organ and tissue mimics. Um, so we can pick and choose these um, for, for different assays and applications. So for example, we have a, a liver model and, a, and an associated liver plate. Um, and this is a 12 well plate, so it, it contains 12 individual liver cultures. Um, we can then create more advanced multi-organ platforms where there is different chambers um, connected together, which contain different organ structures um, fluidically linked. Um, all of these interface with our, um, our common hardware system that you see in the right-hand corner of this slide. Um, and this is very simple to install. It sits um, on the bench top um, and in a, any standard incubator. Um, and allowing people to simply kind of set this up, they can then pick and choose the consumable plate that they're interested in with the associated application um, and then can start work. So to show you a little bit more about the plates and, and how they work and how we utilize them, um, here I'll show you a couple of examples of, of how the fluidics work within these plates. So within all of the consumable plates, we have inbuilt microfluidics. Um, microfluidics perfuses the media either around an individual tissue structure um, or between um, those different cell and tissue models um, that I mentioned. Um, allowing them to interconnect. So on the left-hand side here, you see a diagram of, the, uh, of an individual well on, the, on our liver platform. And the media fuses around each of these individual wells. Um, there, is a, there is a three dimensional scaffold held within this well, on which I'm gonna show you some more details of um, shortly. And the media perfuses directly through this scaffold, recirculates around again and, and, and comes back through the scaffold. So the cells held within um, plate and, and with, particularly within the scaffold are continually exposed to media flow um, and, and, and the bio, biomechanical stimuli that this brings. So we can use those same pump features to then, as I say, connect uh, different well chambers together. So in the multi-organ scenario, and there's a, there's a quite a complex um, example shown here where we have seven individual chambers connected together. Um, we have individual micro pumps connecting each one of these chambers. Um, allowing us to flow media around the platform um, in, a, in a similar way to cardiac output in, your, in the human body. And there are, we have exquisite control around how media flows around this body. So we can control the flow between two organs or three and, and beyond. And this allows us to control um, both the, the stimuli that each individual organ receives 
um, very closely, but then also how media flows around the whole platform, allowing us to control, for example, on-platform pharmacokinetic profiles so that, and, and bioavailability, so cells and tissues on the platform are exposed to uh, human-relevant uh, concentrations of compounds. So to set up an experiment, um, we have a, a broad range of ways of doing this. Um, we, we don't define explicitly what cell types or, or cell sources individual people should use. Um, so we have we generally encourage people to use primary human cells in these platforms. That's what they're designed for. We feel these are the most translationally relevant material to use in building these models. But equally, stem cell derived um, cell sources can be used. We have some individuals who use tissue slices uh, on our platforms, um, as well as other sort of commercially available cell lines. And then these cultures are induced, and we generally keep them alive for significant periods of time. So a key feature of MPS platforms is, is real longevity of culture. So most experiments that we run with these platforms last um, a number of weeks rather than just a number of days. And we then we think very hard, as already mentioned, how we then introduce therapeutics um, and drugs onto these platforms um, and we dose compounds onto the platforms in a way that is physiologically and translationally relevant. <clears throat> and then at the end of any experiment or during the experiment, samples can be taken of both the media um, and the cells to do a really wide range of different endpoint analysis to understand cell health and cell function and phenotype. So we can do full omics analysis on, on each individual micro tissue um, to understand its, its transcriptomic or proteomic profile. We can do a wide range of different microscopy techniques to look at cell morphology, um, and we can look at translationally relevant biomarkers. So using this MPS platform, we can really look to answer a whole range of different questions um, using a range of different tissue structures, looking at both sort of ADME and, and, and TOX type uh, questions, but also then looking at disease modeling um, and looking also at new modalities. Um, we use large molecules, um, gene editing tools in this platform, and they work very successfully. Um, and one particular area where we think this technology will be utilized more in the future um, is in the precision medicine space. This is not something that's, that's been done a lot of just yet, um, but, it, but it, it's one area that, that we're marching towards quite fast. So next, I'm going to show you a little bit of information about our MPS liver platform and, and how we build this and how we can then utilize it. So as I showed you already, we have a 12-well plate uh, liver platform. Each of these wells contains um, a 3D engineered collagen coated scaffold. Um, this scaffold contains uh, 301 individual channels. And what we do is seed into these channels um, generally primary human liver cells, so principally primary hepatocytes. Um, but we also include all range of other non-parenchymal cells um, and even additional immune cells if we want to. Um, and over the first uh, couple of days inside the scaffold, the cells go in as a single cell suspension and they slowly form up to form three-dimensional um, individual micro tissues. So what we achieve after a couple of days is, is three-dimensional micro tissues um, arrayed across this scaffold. And then what we do is is think about and treat this scaffold um, like a biopsy of tissue. So there is clearly some variability across the entire scaffold, but we treat the scaffold as one whole piece um, with, an, which, with the array of micro tissues across it. Um, we can remove individual scaffolds from the plate at, at different time points without affecting the other wells on the platform. So we can do uh, very straightforwardly do very uh, elegant time course analyses. Um, and we can obviously sample very easily the media from the platform. So we can then look at a range of different biomarkers. So some are shown here. And here we do a simple comparison, just showing how standard liver biomarkers on um, things like albumin, uh, SIP, activities, transporters, all of these are uh, both promoted um, in the presence of this 3D perfused platform. Um, and actually, the other thing we know very well is that the platform provides longevity to these hepatic functions, um, allowing a very large window to do uh, assay development. So as an example of, of, of the kind of assays that we can build on this liver platform, I'm going to show you how we built a model of fatty liver disease, um, also, as known, also known as uh, NAFOLD, um, and, and it's more aggressive form NASH. So for those who are, are not aware, NASH is a, um, a metabolic liver disease, which now affects a pretty large proportion um, 
of people in the Western world, and it's directly linked to the obesity epidemic. It's related to type 1 diabetes. And, and NASH is defined by a couple of key features. So principally, it's defined by liver, sorry, fat in the liver um, in the absence of, uh, of excessive alcohol consumption. And this leads to a number of key things. First of all, it leads to uh, excessive liver inflammation, um, and then it leads to liver fibrosis. Uh, this liver fibrosis ultimately leads to scarring and damage of the liver, um, which eventually will become cerotic and therefore irreversible. And as we currently stand today, there are no currently approved drugs for the treatment of NASH. Uh, and so as a result, there's a, there's a large desire to design new therapeutics to, to treat this disease um, for all the people that, that now have it. So we took our MPS liver model um, and asked how we can build a, a model of, of human NASH, or fatty liver disease. And the way that we do that is described in this schematic. So we take primary human Kupfer cells, primary human hepatocytes, primary human hepatic stellate cells, and then a cocktail of fat, sugars, um, insulin, et cetera. We bring all these together onto our MPS platform, uh, and, and then we can recapitulate the human uh, disease. We can then introduce uh, the therapeutics of interest uh, to test how they from a pensy reverse this phenotype, uh, a disease phenotype that we see. So just using some, some simple immunofluorescent staining, we can see the presence of, uh, of Kupfer cells and stellate cells. So these integrate within the three-dimensional liver tissues that, are, that I've already shown you. Um, and we incorporate uh, physiologically relevant ratios of, of Kupfer and stellate cells. Um, and we can do so actually, but also in a variable manner. So if we want to look at mechanistic studies, we can run the model, for example, with and without stellate cells. We can increase the number of stellate cells. Um, we can find different donors with different genetic backgrounds. So we can explore a really wide range of, uh, of different mechanistic areas of this model um, to explore how a particular pathways develop um, or how particular targets will change uh, different patient populations. And when we take this model and explore its transcriptomic profile, we see a, a couple of very clear things. Um, so the overall transcriptional profile of this model very clearly maps um, the primary human NASH. And we do that by exploring um, online databases, asking the database um, in an unbiased fashion, what uh, disease state does it observe? Um, and it very clearly identifies, you'll see this on the left-hand side, identifies the transcriptional profile of our model to be human NASH. And when we go one level further, um, we can look at the key genes associated um, with NASH. And there are some very nice publications now showing um, key gene sets of, of 200, 300 genes that are known to be up and down regulated in this disease state. And when we look at all of those very specific genes associated with this disease and see if those are changed in, in the right way in our model, and we see very good associations with, with, with our model, and nearly the vast majority of these genes uh, are changing, and, and that's in real contrast to some of the classical murine models um, of NASH that have been used over many years, um, and these simply don't recapitulate the, the transcriptional profile of, of human NASH. So our MPS model um, recapitulates the really key features that I already mentioned about this disease. So for example, we see uh, significant infl in liver inflammation occurring in the model. We can track that. Um, using multiplex cytokine analysis, and we see as the model progresses, a range of inflammatory markers being promoted. Um, we have developed a confocal microscopy approach uh, to look at the presence of ECM proteins uh, being laid down um, in the 3D tissue structures um, within the scaffold. And we see these only in the presence of, uh, of, the NASH, of the NASH model. If we make a more basic steatosis, just liver loading model, we don't see this. Uh, we don't see this fibrosis. And then finally, obviously, we can also measure fat loading as the core basis for this disease state. Um, we see the cells become fatty, and we, we have methodologies to quantify this using ORIO. And so to demonstrate the utility of this, um, we've done work to look at how we can put compounds into this model to uh, reduce and, and, and knock down the, the disease uh, phenotype. So I'm just, gonna sh I'm just showing you here data looking at at that fibrosis imaging endpoint. So we can look at the presence of extracellular collagen one um, and smooth muscle actin. When we dose two compounds, they're in late stage of clinical development. Um, these are a beta cholic acid uh, labeled here as OCA and elafibrinol uh, labeled here as ELF. 
So both of these molecules are in phase three clinical trial, um, known to be uh, fairly effective against NASH um, in, in other preclinical and in clinical studies. We put these molecules into our system at physiologically relevant concentrations. We get very clear dose dependent knockdown of both SMA as shown by the graph on the, on the top right and of collagen type one on the, on the bottom right. Um, so this is a this is a very powerful output. Um, it's very reproducible um, and really validates the use of this model for for doing drug development uh, and drug discovery for for NASH. So I now want to move away from um, from the NASH model and show you a little bit about how we use our MPS platform for drug absorption metabolism um, type approaches. So we can do this um, first of all using our our liver model that we've already been talking about. So we published this paper a couple of years ago, um, showing how our liver model um, in its healthy state can be used to predict a human drug clearance. And what we did was to take six different probe, um, fairly standard molecules. We put them in the system. We do this with a whole range of different donor materials. Um, and we see all of these drugs being metabolized away. We can see the presence of human specific um, phase one, phase two metabolites. And what we can then do is take this data and extrapolate it forward and, and predict the clearance of these compounds um, in humans. So what you see here on the right hand side is a comparison between data from the MPS platform and clinical data. So in the gray dots um, and the graph on the right hand side, you see clearance data for the clearance of lidocaine. Um, and then in the red line with the kind of shady bar around it, you see the clearance of lidocaine in our model um, and, and how it overlays really, really nicely with with the clinical clearance data. So we can get genuine translation from the in vitro um, through to the in vivo um, for drug clearance. So to extend um, models of for DMPK, we don't just need liver, there are obviously other organs involved. So we've also developed models of the human gut. Um, so to do this, we, uh, we use a trans well based approach where we have a co-culture of gut epithelial cells um, cultured on a perfused uh, trans well setup. So here we have a different well structure as you see in the schematic on the left hand side. And what we get in this scenario um, with this perfused co culture, first of all, is an intestinal uh, epithelial barrier that, that produces mucus. Um, and we compare this to standard static um, KCO2 type approaches. And as well as producing mucus, what we see is a clear change in morphology. Um, and a three-dimensional nature to this tissue. So when we look at IHC staining, as you see here on the left-hand side, um, the morphology of the tissue is, is complex and is deep and fairly nicely closely represents the morphology of the human gut. And we compare that to standard KCO2 cultures, which are a monolayer of, of single cells. And when we start to look at other functional uh, responses um, and, and outputs from this model, um, one thing we see very clearly is that KCO2, standard KCO2 models are known to be very, very tight. So when we look at tier um, tissue integrity uh, assessments of these, these KCO2 models on the right-hand side, you see very high values for the KCO-only um, models. And when we have this perfused co-culture system, we have much reduced tier. So the tissue integrity is, um, is much closely represents uh, the human gut. And then we can then start to measure that by looking at drug permeability. And so, for example, we see the system to be much more permeable. And we see that through, for example, dextran permeability shown here on the bottom right. But we can combine some of these cultures together to look at multi-organ um, interaction studies to actually replicate um, drug absorption and metabolism in the same setup using a, a gut liver MPS. So on the left-hand side here, you see how these two uh, organ systems can be set up actually in the same well in a relatively simple manner. So you have the gut um, trans well at the top, and then we can have a hepatic tissue structure um, at the bottom. And here what we can do is put compounds into the system. We can dose them into the apical side of the trans well. We can watch them be absorbed through the gut um, and then be metabolized away by the liver. So what we see, for example, with diclofenac, um, known to be relatively fastly absorbed by the gut um, and then metabolized away by the liver by CYP2C9, um, that's exactly what we see in our model. So we see a relatively fast absorption um, and then it metabolizes away. Um, and for example, when we compare that to uh, a different type of drug like a tenolol, this is a very slowly absorbed drug um, and it's a really clear compound. So in our model, we see this very slow absorption um, in the presence of the gut model. Um, 
and then it simply accumulates in the system because there is no kidney model here to clear it away. Um, with our collaborators uh, at MIT, and um, we've also done more advanced gut-liver interaction studies, um, with where here the gut and the liver are in separate chambers. Um, and again, we can we can do studies with diclofenac. Um, and what we do here is again, the diclofenac is dosed in the apical side of the gut NPS. Um, it goes through the gut, we can detect it, and we can measure it coming through the gut, um, going through that round into the mixing chamber, going to the liver, and then um, over the course of 48 hours being, um, and 72 hours being metabolized away and, and being disappearing from the system. So one final example I want to give you um, is, a, is a how we use our system to culture lung cells, um, and then how we point this in a toxicology um, type of space. So uh, we can culture lung cells, again, using a transwell-based approach. Here we have an air-liquid interface. Um, so we have an air side of the lung epithelium and, 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 a, and a blood side or a, or a media side. And this is, again, where the fluidic flow is. Um, and in this scenario, we have primary human, liver, uh, sorry, primary human lung cells. And these create a number of the key physiological features of, of, the prior, uh, uh, of lung. And here we're looking at bronchial epithelium. So these bronchial uh, epithelia uh, have, have a thick uh, thickness to their structures. We see, so this is not, again, not a single layer of cells. Um, they produce microvilli. So these can be seen both on the IHC staining, but also by using alpha tubulin staining in the, in the IF image here. Um, we get no very nice tight junction formation. Um, and this then allows, uh, again, we can measure this integrity tight junctions using uh, tear. And this lung system, just like the gut system, will also produce mucus. So this is a top-down face contrast image looking at the production of mucus after just a few days in culture. And um, we can quantify this. Um, and again, these cultures can be, can be cultured for extended periods of time. So the, uh, a lot of the data I've shown you here will show goes out to 28 days. We have a really extended culture period for, for these lung epithelial cells, allowing you to, to have a real wide window, uh, assay window, to, to do studies. We can then link um, these liver cultures, sorry, these lung cultures to liver cultures to potentially again make multi organ setups um, to look at how aerosolized um, agents potentially uh, have acute but also uh, effects in, in secondary organs. What we did in this study was to create a lung liver co culture. And first of all, we demonstrated that the two organs could be cultured together for, for, ex for an extended period of time. So we looked at standard metrics of liver function, um, here showing you albumin and, and lung function. So we have the tear measurements um, over 12 days, and these are very stable. Um, this is using a single uh, media that's connecting these two together. And when we took this setup, we could introduce an insult to the system, and, and we see that the lung culture um, is damaged by this insult um, and this dosing of this insult. And in the presence of the liver, the, the liver provides a protective Effect. It clearly metabolizes away somehow the, the insult, uh, allowing the lung to survive for much longer following this chronic insult. And we can use, um, so that's measured here by you looking at tear, but we can also see this through imaging. Um, and so we can see this genuine crosstalk between these two organs. So in summary, hopefully what I've shown you is that the MPS platforms are, are preclinical tools that, uh, that are really available now. Um, uh, and, and these are available for use for both uh, safety and efficacy testing of, of new therapeutics, new compounds, but also can be used um, uh, for chemical and, and consumer products testing, particularly in the toxicology space. And we now see that, uh, that these platforms uh, are being really taken up and evaluated fully by the pharmaceutical industry and being adopted to, to start making uh, project-specific and compound-specific decisions. And at CMBio, a really key thing is, is that we're building these platforms um, to make them reliable, robust, usable for people, um, easy to set up, um, and flexible so that people can uh, move and easily switch between, for example, liver models, um, gut models, or gut and liver models together. Um, and so we have these single and multi-organ MPS models um, now available with the associated biological assays. 
So I thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you have um, more questions, um, please reach out to us. There is a lot more information about um, our models. We have a whole um, back catalogue of, of peer review publications about the models that we've built over a number of years, both um, for ourselves and with our collaborators um, in academia and in industry. So I encourage you to go to our website at cn-bio.com to find out more information. Um, and, and thank you again.